All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our fifth webinar of 2021, a part of our patient ambassador program. Um, April is Donate Life Month, and it's awesome. We are super excited to be celebrating. Um, this webinar is one way that we're celebrating uh, National Donate Life Month. And also for CKF, it's um, it's time to celebrate the start of our 2021 Bounce Back Give Back Awards. Um, my name is Cece. I'm the program manager for the Chris Kluge Foundation. Um, I'll be introducing you today uh, to today's moderator and panelists. And I would first like to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rest Foundation. So if you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We are going to have a brief Q&A at the end, so we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A as they come to mind. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Balan Keeper is a kidney and liver transplant recipient, as well as one of our 2017 Bounce Back Give Back Award winners. An accomplished public speaker, Balan has shared her story numerous times in many different ways, most notably in her award-winning biography, My Favorite American. She has helped raise over $1 million for polycystic kidney disease research and is an appointed national spokesperson for the University Kidney Research Organization. More recently, she was selected to walk the runway as a dreamer for the 2019 Dreamwalk Fashion Show in New York City. Edward Drake. Edward Drake is a kidney transplant recipient and 2015 CKF Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. During his time on the transplant waitlist, Edward started the Why Not Foundation to raise awareness of kidney health and organ donation, and to assist young people emotionally and financially through the transplant process. He's also an active public speaker with Lifeline Ohio and continues to advocate for organ donation awareness, particularly in the African American community. Next, we have Tracy Copeland. Tracy Copeland is a liver transplant recipient and 2020 CKF Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. She is the founder and president of Sierra Nevada Donor Awareness, as well as an avid athlete participating in triathlons, marathons, the US Transplant Games, and the World Transplant Games. Whew. On the one year anniversary of her transplant, Tracy met her deceased donor's family, and they have remained close friends ever since. Finally, we have Brian Hindley. Brian is a liver transplant recipient and 2018 Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. During his time on the waitlist, Brian and his lovely wife, Kim, were the subjects of a documentary called No Greater Love that focuses on the increasing need for organ donors in the United States. After receiving his new liver, Brian became the first firefighter slash paramedic ever to return to work after receiving a solid organ transplant. Brian is a passionate ambassador and volunteers with many organizations within the transplant community. And last but certainly not least, your moderator for today's webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Kluge Foundation, Chris Kluge. Cece, thank you very much. Thanks for the nice intro. I wanna say hi to my uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award winner friends. Nice to, uh, nice to see everybody again. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And I have to say that the four of you have done so much for the transplant community and given so much back. Um, I just love what you guys do. You're, uh, there's a reason you won the Bounce Back Give Back uh, Award in the past. And thanks so much for all you do to, to help others going through the same thing that uh, all of us did. Um, I'm inspired and in, impressed by uh, all of the great work you do. So thank you. Keep it up. And nice to see you too, since we haven't uh, seen one another uh, with COVID. It's uh, good to see our friends. I've said this on our uh, previous webinars, I miss my friends. So nice that we can at least connect uh, virtually with what's still going on in the world. Um, I'd like to open up just to share my story for a couple of minutes and then uh, give each of our panelists an opportunity to uh, share their version of their stories. Uh, Cece did a wonderful job introducing everybody, but uh, I'd like to hear it in your own words, uh, your experience and, and transplant uh, journey as well. So I'll share mine just for a couple minutes and then I'll pass the microphone to uh, our panelists so each of them can do the same. Uh, I am uh, approaching 21 years since my life-saving liver transplant and uh, happy to still be here. One of my favorite things to say is that I'm way healthier, way stronger than uh, I ever was before my transplant. I met with my uh, liver disease specialist, um, Dr. Burton from University uh, Colorado Hospital yesterday 
and uh, got a good checkup. I got my vaccination and it seems to have worked with the antibodies test. So happy about that. And, you know, talking 21 years post-transplant as we approach that, um, you know, still dialing in the anti-rejection drug cocktail and wondering, you know, what that looks like in the uh, decades ahead, hopefully. So a uh, good conversation. I got a, a clean bill of health. So looks like I'm going to be around a little bit longer. Uh, I was on a transplant waiting list for almost six years in total. And all of us on this call that have been there, we know how scary that is, what a precarious place that is to be. As an athlete, I always like being in control of my future and my own health. And you really aren't when you're on a transplant waiting list. You're hoping and you're praying for a second chance, hoping that you'll get that call and not be one of the scary statistics that unfortunately uh, all of us are all too familiar with, with this uh, disease called, a, called the waiting game. Uh, I really was in denial for so long um, regarding my liver disease and then finally came to terms with the fact that I did need a liver transplant and uh, really got serious for what I always referred to as my race for my life and trained for that, uh, that race for my life to give myself the best possible outcome and, and chance to uh, bounce back and, and return to the quality of life that I enjoy today. And I really had a, a miraculous recovery. I had a great transplant team in, at University of Colorado in Denver and uh, obviously a donor that, that said yes and, and made the uh, most heroic and selfless decision that I think uh, an individual can make and save my life and, and save three others. And I'm here because of uh, my donor and, and my donor family. And as I said, their heroic decision. Uh, I had a, a pretty, uh, pretty fast recovery. I was out of the hospital four days later and um, the anti-rejection drugs that I still take today, as I mentioned earlier, uh, didn't cause any rejection, no infection, and was able to get back on my snowboard just seven weeks later and representing our country uh, again in my second Winter Olympic Games where I won a bronze medal in Salt Lake City in 2002. And I got to enjoy what was uh, probably the two uh, most fun weeks of my life and uh, a great experience I got to share with my friends, my family, and also my donor family. Uh, I got to participate in other Winter Olympic Games in 2010 where I finished in seventh place in Vancouver. And uh, that culminated a, a 20 plus year World Cup and, and Olympic career. And you know, I really realized in, in 2002 that I had a great um, podium to speak from and uh, decided that, you know, I, I had made a commitment when I was on that transplant waiting list for almost six years. I said, if I get through this, I'm gonna uh, give back and uh, help those that are going through the same thing I did in uh, the spring and summer of, of 2000 as I got that transplant on July 28th of 2000. And that's what CKF is all about. And in a fun and entertaining way uh, and using this vehicle of action sports really uh, getting the message out there about organ and, and tissue donation awareness. We do three things at CKF, uh, register, educate, and inspire. And uh, certainly the uh, inspiration part of this is uh, something we're going to hear about from our four panelists and what they're all about and, uh, and also have done so much work to help uh, educate people about the importance of organ donation and make sure everyone that, that needs a transplant can get one. And so uh, thanks again to our panelists for being a part of this call today, thanks to our friends at Hearts for Us for sponsoring it. And uh, let's dive into it. Enough about my story. I want to uh, pass the mic and Val, let me get to start with you uh, for just a few minutes if you would share your version of your story. By the way, you look awesome. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, can't wait to talk with you here a little bit. I think we just need your, uh, you're on muted there. Oh my gosh, I'm the classic person that did it. I think this is the first time. Even better. <laughs> Hi, Chris. It's so nice to see you. You too. Um, Thanks for joining us. I'm very excited to be here today. And I just am in awe by the miracle of transplantation. This summer, I will be celebrating 19 years since my kidney transplant and three years since my liver transplant. It gives me goosebumps every time I say it because I just feel so lucky to have received a miracle twice in life. And I needed both of these transplants because of polycystic kidney disease, which is a disease I inherited from my mother's side of the family. It has taken countless members of my family's lives. I 
we have a really small family. I didn't meet a lot of my family members because of this disease. I'm actually the first in our family to be transplanted and the youngest to endorse such severe side effects from the disease. So I was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease when I was 10 years old. I've been a patient most of my life and had a really challenging journey through middle school and high school until I was 19 years old and in need of a life-saving kidney transplant. At 18, I was in the hospital for almost a year. They took both of my kidneys out. I was on dialysis and I was actually too sick to be put on the transplant waiting list. So I needed a living kidney donor to survive. And I was fortunate to have Dr. Robert Montgomery take the risk of transplanting me in that very ill state and to have my, a dear family friend step forward and say yes to being my donor. And because of those two miracles, I'm still here today. And receiving the kidney transplant at 19, it has allowed me to grow into the 38-year-old woman that I am today to discover what I love in life, what I enjoy and I'm good at. It allowed me to meet Noah and become his wife and all of these extraordinary things that I would have been that young teenager that would have died if it wasn't for transplantation. And it allowed me to discover my passion of being a patient advocate. Because when I was younger, I didn't know anyone else going through a similar experience. And right now I'm striving to be the role model I wish I had when I was younger. So I was doing really well for a while. And all of a sudden in my early thirties, I became really sick again. And here I needed a second transplant, this time a liver. And my family and I were just blown away and devastated by it. We thought I sort of conquered PKD by getting my kidneys out and a kidney transplant. And unfortunately that wasn't the case. And for me, we had to travel out of state in order to get my liver transplant. And with a liver, you don't have the bridge and lifeline of a dialysis machine. And I was really scared. I didn't know if I would make it. And then you think you go through one miracle in life. Am I going to be lucky enough to receive another miracle? And I was, and I am like bursting with gratitude every day because of it. I was grateful after my kidney transplant and was a passionate patient advocate. But the gratitude I felt when I woke up from my liver transplant, I just knew I was alive for a reason. And it has every day has been amazing to show my gratitude through the advocacy work that I do. And I'm really excited to be here today and for the conversations that we're going to share. So thank you for this opportunity. Alan, so nice to catch up with you. I love who you are and, and what you do for the transplant community and for others. And thank you. It's uh, thank you. Way to speak with you and I'm glad you're uh, looking so great and feeling so good. Thank you so much, Chris. Awesome. I've got some good questions for you and I have to say it was very powerful um, when you talk about waiting for your liver transplant. You were of course in Aspen together with Noah as our Bounce Back Give Back award winner and uh, that was very powerful as you were going through that uh, having had a kidney transplant many years earlier and uh, waiting for the liver transplant and uh, I'm glad that we got to be a part of that. And obviously that you got the liver transplant are doing so well. Thank you, Chris. All right, I wanna pass the microphone to uh, another uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award winner, our 2015 recipient, fellow uh, kidney transplant recipient, Edward Drake. Hey, how are you? So good to see you, Chris. Yeah, you too, you look great. Oh, no, nah, like. Likewise, likewise, and it's a tough, it's a tough follow after Valen. Like I'm still in awe with her story. Um, it's very, very touching, and I and I commend, I commend you, and keep up the great work. But uh, as I like to tell everybody, I'm just an ordinary individual trying to do extraordinary things with uh, Christ who lives within me. Uh, I was diagnosed with end stage renal disease just before my 21st birthday back in 2006, I believe it was. I really don't count the years no more as I just count the days and just be thankful. But during a routine physical, uh, the doctors were alarmed by my blood pressure reading. Uh, I never had any, any, uh, any previous health issues or concerns in the past. Uh, I, was, I was in college uh, working to become the first college graduate and football player in my family, athlete in my family on a collegiate level. 
when uh, doing a routine physical, uh, the doctors rushed me to the hospital due to my blood pressure. And uh, I just remember on that day, my life changed forever. Uh, uh, the doctor came in with a with a crazy look on his face and said, uh, "Your kidneys completely shut down." At that time, I was so young and naive. I didn't I didn't really even know what my kidneys were. I was just like, "Okay, what's next?" And he told me I would have to start dialysis the next day. And again, I was like, "Okay, you know, what's next?" Um, well, I'd be okay to go return back to school that August. I got sick in June, so I was like, "Well, I'd be okay to return back to school that August and report to camp." And it really hit me when he said that I would not be able to go to school and I never would be able to play sports again. And then the next day, I just remember them sticking tubes in me everywhere and sticking my dialysis port in my chest and where I, where I, I begun my journey of dialysis, uh, which I'd done for three years. Uh, but I started that journey in that dialysis center. I was just like, Lord, why me? Why now? I was in there with all these old, all these older people and the walls were gray and uh, the lady next to me will go to the hospital. I was just talking to her one treatment. The next day, they said she died. And and I experienced a lot of those type of uh, experiences. And like I said, I'm 20. I'm 20 years old thinking the world is mine. Like I said, I was, you know, the day, a few days before I was partying with my buddies, you know. But just while sitting up in that dialysis room, just like, Lord, why me? Why now? I'm crying. The man up above said, clearly said one day, son, why not you? He revealed to me what you have planned for your what you have planned for your life isn't what I have planned for your life. I had all these all these grand visions and sports and business, but I say he took me off that college campus, that sporting battlefield, and put me on a battlefield of saving lives. And immediately, when they say uh, your attitude changed, my altitude in life changed. Then I was inspired to start the Why Not Foundation with the help of so many amazing individuals over the years. So I truly appreciate them, the entire team, Why Not, past and present. And that gave me meaning. I got a new meaning in life, you know. I knew I started going to visit the kids in the hospital and seeing people who were in worse off situations. So instead of me complaining about not being able to play football, I'm thinking about kids who can't even go to school or, you know, who, who I can't eat pizza no more but they could never eat pizza and could never do the things I could do. So once again, my attitude changed, so did my altitude and change, my altitude and life changed. And uh, 15 years later, the man up above have allowed me to be able to travel the world uh, through, through this vehicle, as you call it, Chris, through this vehicle, just impacting lives, touching others. And it's not about me because like I said, I'm still a businessman outside of here, but the, the, uh, the, the platform that I've been able to bless others with, and like the the young the young the young Valens who was who was ten year old ten ten year old when they were sick and the young young people to give them potential job opportunities and to be to give them resources that 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 um yeah to provide them with resources is the most meaningful thing and uh it's truly a blessing and like I said uh like I said I, I lost my purpose or I say I lost my dream but I found my purpose and and I'm living in it every day and it's such an honor to be amongst you all thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thanks for all you're doing with Why Not Foundation, too. It's uh, I get to act as the MC and keep this conversation uh, moving and uh, and hopefully entertaining. But uh, I really am inspired by all of you guys on this call today and love what you're doing. Thank you. Tracy Copeland, our uh, 2020 Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. And Tracy, you got uh, the short end of the stick a little bit during COVID. You didn't get to come uh, do the Summit for Life event with us in person and uh, and experience all of that. But I promise you, you will uh, hopefully this year as we're returning to uh, in-person events here in Aspen and we'll get back and, and we really have a great celebration ahead after uh, I know so much uh, pent up demand for socializing and seeing our friends again and participating uh, in person. But uh, you are uh, also the president of Sierra, uh, Sierra uh, Nevada Donor Services, and uh, want, to, uh, want to give you a chance to share your story for a few minutes. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. And I look forward to coming out to Aspen this year and climbing that mountain. So um, thank you so much for having me. And truly, I am really honored and humbled to be recognized amongst all these other wonderful, amazing stories and people that you have. Um, Hearing uh, Valen's story and Edward's just amazing. Um, 
I too, I am very grateful for the to the Lord for my life today and that I am here. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to share and honor my donor, Terry Lee Snow. So as we've already heard, and as you all know, every story is quite unique. And my story started in 1998 when my liver died suddenly for reasons we don't know. So one day I was active and healthy and skiing with my husband and then I became quite ill. And over about a three month period, my liver died. I was um, visiting with my doctor. He, he said there was a hepatologist coming up from Stanford University on a Friday afternoon and I needed to be there. And the first thing she said was, where's your husband? We need to speak with you both. Well, this was before we all carried around cell phones and pagers and all this stuff, so we couldn't get a hold of him. But she said, there's a plane leaving for San Jose this evening at seven o'clock and I've already looked and there's a seat available and you need to be on that plane. Tomorrow, you're gonna check in to Stanford. They already have a bed waiting for you. Tomorrow, we're gonna do a biopsy on your liver. And that was the first time that anybody mentioned the possibility of a liver transplant. So I had no idea what that meant. I went back to work after that appointment, stacked up a few things on the table, um, wrote a note to my boss that I'll see you Monday, and <laughs> got on an airplane. But um, certainly there were different plans because Monday I found myself in a coma and on the list for a liver. And I woke up Thursday afternoon with the gift of life. And if it wasn't for the decision of another family that I didn't know, myself and a heart recipient and a lung recipient and two kidney recipients would likely have passed. So I'm very grateful. And as Cece mentioned, I had the unique blessing and opportunity to meet my donor's family, Terry's family, on the one year anniversary of Terry's death and my life. So John and Kathy Snow traveled up here to Reno with their daughter, Lynn, to meet my husband and my family and my daughter and I. And uh, it was truly a blessing to know them. It's very surreal to meet the family for the first time, but we've become very close and we um, seek every opportunity to share our story together. As a matter of fact, Kathy comes every year. She's only missed two. Last year was one of them. And another year she was on a cruise. So I had to give her a bye for the donor walk, but she comes out and helps us with the donor walk every year. And um, it, it was actually Kathy who was a nurse at the time of Terry's death. She became a renal transplant coordinator as a result of her experience. And she was the one who came by and told me about the transplant game. So in 2002, uh, we traveled to Florida accompanied by the snows and attended my first trans U.S. transplant game. Since then, I attended four transplant games with the U.S. in the U.S. with the snows by my side. And I was um, fortunate to participate in three world transplant games as well. And in one of those times in 2008, we thought we'd do a, do a little fundraiser up here and we did a walk around the Sparks Marina. Well, we quickly learned that we really had an opportunity to impact our community with this walk. Um, we don't have a transplant center here in Northern Nevada. So everybody has to travel um, to California or Arizona or uh, Southern Nevada has a kidney transplant facility, but that's it. No, no, nothing, no other organs are transplanted there. So we also at the time didn't have any kind of outreach in our area. So quickly at that first walk, we really had to uh, realize that there was a tremendous opportunity for us to raise awareness for the tremendous need for organ and tissue donation and show the success. And truly for me as a transplant recipient to honor our donors and our donor families. So I continued with the walk every year. And in 2011, 2011, I founded Sierra Nevada Donor Awareness, which is a completely volunteer nonprofit organization here in Northern Nevada that seeks to raise awareness for the need for organ and tissue donation by honoring donors and donor families at our signature donor walk at the Sparks Marina. So this year we're grateful, we'll be back on track. We're very hopeful, but we're scheduling our donor walk for the third uh, Sunday of September at the Sparks Marina. And so we're truly, truly grateful for that opportunity for me to be able to um, honor my donor, Terry Snow, in this way. Uh, again, my education in organ and, and tissue donation came entirely after my transplant. I had a little pink dot on my license, but I really had no idea what that meant. I had no idea the implications of the dot. I didn't know about 
uh, the amount of time that most people sit on the waiting list uh, sick, waiting for that life-saving transplant. So truly for me, it was a miracle that mine came so quickly. And at the 11th hour, they didn't expect me to make it through the next day. But uh, so Sierra Nevada donor awareness has been kind of my baby, but I have a huge volunteer group. They're amazing. Uh, they're the people who make the walk successful every year. And I absolutely couldn't do it without them. So I'm so grateful for them. And Sierra Nevada Donor Awareness has been able to put uh, over $80,000 back into our community in the form of financial aid for people whose lives have been impacted by organ and tissue donation. So uh, for me, that's the best opportunity and way to give back to my community and to honor my donor. And again, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you and these just wonderful panelists that you have today. And thank you for inviting me to be along for the ride. You bet, Tracy, and I look forward to welcoming you to Aspen uh, this winter. Congrats on all the medals in the background for your marathon and triathlon, and of course, transplant game successes and, uh, and the great work you're doing uh, with, your new, with your organization. Thank you. Good job. All right, I want to, uh, want to pass the mic now to our uh, final panelists. One of the original donor dudes. Uh, this guy's a huge inspiration to me. Brian Hinesley, a fellow liver transplant recipient. The uh, first, uh, oh, pardon me. The first, uh, sorry about that, Brian. Uh, in the middle of my introduction, <laughs> the first uh, organ transplant recipient to return to uh, being a firefighter and a first responder after transplantation. And uh, Brian, like Valen and Tracy and Edward, you do so much for this transplant community and uh, excited to, ha to have a conversation with you today. Thank you. Oh, Chris, it's, it's, it's truly my pleasure. I'm, I'm honored. I'm, I'm, I'm beat after hearing the other three people like, oh, good Lord, I'm last and I'm worn out. I, what we've all gone through is, is, is truly incredible. And, and to be in the presence of all, all of you, um, I, I'm sitting here looking at my wife going, I'm sweating beads and I'm, I'm beat because I, it, we live through each one of those person, people. We know what we all went through. And uh, to hear it on that personal basis is still, it's, it's still hard to hear. And to know that people are out there still waiting is, is why we're here today, right? That we're not quitting. We, it's not we received our organ and we're moving down the road. We're, we're still fighting for those folks that are, are questioning, are they going to make it or not? So, um, yeah. So like Chris says, you know, I was a young fireman. I, I was full of everything. I was going to set the world on fire and then put it out all on my, by myself. And, uh, Shortly after I got hired on as a fireman, my dream job, I was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis and uh, my life changed. It, it changed dramatically to the point where they said, uh, it looks like your career as a fireman's over and it just started. So um, we went on this journey and I asked, well, how do we fix this autoimmune hepatitis? And that was, you know, early nineties uh, with a liver transplant. So I, I did uh, what people do and I hid from it. Right. I hid and I ran and I denied and this isn't me. And doggone it, there's got to be another way to get this done. And uh, I did that for too long. And I, I was very fortunate. Uh, my wife and I, we've known each other forever. Kim and I, we've known each other since high school. But uh, she came back in my life with purpose and she got me on track and says, look, we need to get to the doctors. We need to get on track. This liver transplant thing, whatever it is, it's in God's hands. And we're going to we're going to go through this together. So got on track, uh, regular doctor's appointment, accepted this now as my mission to not only receive the transplant, but to become healthy enough to be her husband and our daughter Megan's dad. And that gave me purpose in life. Along the way of waiting for the transplant, now I'm off work and I'm losing weight and I'm sick. Um, we, we get a, a, a strange phone call and it's from a production company says, hey, you know, the United States government, Health and Human Services would like to do a documentary about organ donation. And we would like to pick you for some of the follows. So they were in our house. It, it's kind of a, a weird scenario. But for two years prior to my transplant, we had a film crew in our house quite frequently and at my doctor's appointments and everywhere like that, following us with these cameras. And they caught some pretty bizarre stuff. Um, what, it, what it's like to be living at home. Um, March 21st, 2000, they were at UCLA with me. 
uh, on the day I received my transplant and they went into the operating room and uh, they caught this on tape and, and I, I, I didn't realize they were there, but uh, I remember telling the doctor and they caught this on tape, but it's not in the documentary, but I remember saying, don't put me out in case the doctor has a question. I'm here to answer it for him. You see, I'm a paramedic. I kind of know everything. And I had this really, really bizarre attitude that I want to watch this and I want to answer any questions in case that needs to be. Uh, a few hours later, I wake up and Chris, I woke up for that moment. I don't remember the last time I felt good. I felt clear minded and I felt purpose. Hours after my transplant, I knew who I was, what I'm going to do and how I'm going to get there. And it was full steam ahead out of that, uh, that uh, ICU seven days later um, on my way home and telling my wife, we're not stopping. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going back to work. And, and we'd already known because we talked to the doctor. There was no record of a firefighter paramedic ever receiving a liver transplant going back to work. And I said, you know what? That's a small hurdle. Full steam ahead. Six months and one day after my transplant, I returned to work as a first firefighter paramedic. And I was on a mission. And that mission was to do what we're doing today. There's somebody behind us that needs help, needs inspiration. One of the things along my way my doctor did for me was every time I got down, he brought in a post-transplant liver recipient to show me what life after transplant was like. And I thought, doggone it, that's what I'm going to do after my transplant. I'm going to go out and inspire the documentary come, come, comes out, it wins an Emmy, we get uh, some national recognition, and we start speaking. We meet you, we meet Ken Moritsuku, the Surgeon General of the United States at the time, and we find that we have a little gift. We have a little niche here. Our, our passion bleeds out of us, and people get inspired from that. My wife nominates me for the Bounce Back Give Back Award, which was awesome, and I'm here with you all today just... I'm fired up. I would have run around the block right now. <laughs> I love it. I love your energy, Brian. Love uh, talking with you. And you and I have uh, teamed up a lot in the past to uh, spread the message of organ donation awareness together. Yeah. Always have fun with you. And yeah. love the energy. And as you mentioned, it's also very much a, a family endeavor for you with uh, your daughter, Megan, and your wife, Kim. And uh, we've had some great events together and uh, we, lots yeah. more to have. Absolutely. Lots more ahead for sure, sir. I Lots more. It. Thanks. Yeah. For you bet. All right. Let's jump into some questions. Edward, can I start with you? I'd like to uh, ask you, you started giving back to the transplant community before you had actually received your transplant. Uh, as you mentioned, you created the Why Not Foundation. Well, uh, even while you were on the wait list, uh, what motivated you to start raising awareness um, as you were going through this whole challenge, and as you said, your life got turned upside down, you were at college, you were pursuing your football dreams, and uh, you did a, a 180 degree turn and you said, you know, I'm going to start why not and I'm going to give back and help others. How, how did you in the midst of your uh, challenges and adversity, decide to give back and, and help other people. Uh. Edward, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you uh, hear me okay? We're, we seem to be having a problem with uh, Edward's connection, so we'll wait for him to get that back together. I'll come back to him on that question. Uh, Valen, can you hear me okay? Can I uh, pose a question to you? Absolutely. Hey, Chris. Awesome. We'll come back to Edward. We had a uh, issue with his connection for some reason. Um, Valen, you began your transplant journey at a very young age, as you uh, as you shared in your uh, opening comments there, what role did your support system have in how you bounce, bounce back from your kidney transplant and later your liver transplant? Oh my goodness, support has been everything, Chris, and I'm sure you know that as well. It's been interesting going through all of this from a child until present day, because my parents, they're they showed me unconditional love and their dedication is just so admirable. Uh, their support just gave me something to fight for. I knew that I was loved, that I wasn't alone. When I was in the hospital for almost a year, every day I could count on my parents being there. And that just gave me something to look forward to, something to fight for. And when you're growing up and younger, it's of course, hard for kids around your age to connect and understand what's going on and to be able to provide that support. 
So my parents were my rock growing up. And then if I wasn't lucky enough to have them, I now have Noah, my husband, and you know Noah, and he's just extraordinary. And he, I never imagined to be able to share my life with someone that would show me such unconditional love as well. So my parents guiding me through my kidney transplant, and then now as a woman, Noah helping me through my liver transplant, as well as my parents still on board, has just been amazing to me and, or for me. And we need something to, to fight for. And for me, going through my liver transplant, it was really striving to be the strong wife again, to be able to enjoy life with Noah. Um, I hated the thought of me passing away and him being a young widow. That thought actually fueled me immensely because I was like, that is not going to happen. I'm going to survive. I'm going to get a liver transplant. And now to be on the other side and be the strong woman that I didn't know was possible, but had hoped for is amazing. And now I am striving to be the support for others that I wish I had when I was younger. I don't want anyone else to feel alone. I want them through my efforts of now I've shared my story at over a hundred events across North America. I've done a lot of writing to educate and been so fortunate to have amazing collaborations with organizations like yours, Chris, and to receive the Bounce Back Give Back Award and all of these platforms to hopefully provide that support. And people need hope. They need someone to look to, to see that they're is an amazing life post-transplant. And I didn't have that visual. And I think that visual is so powerful. And I want to be that for other people, for them to see that life can be amazing and that it is hard and it takes work and we have to be the best advocate for ourselves, but it's a beautiful life. It's a, a perspective and a gratitude, this gratitude like no other. And it has been my support system that has helped carry me through and guide me and get me to today where I am. And I hope that I'm also in turn giving that support back to many others. I always say, Valen, that you don't win an Olympic medal without a great team and you don't get through uh, an organ transplant successfully without a great team. And both mm -hmm. you and I had uh, a lot of support and uh, it sure made a difference for both of us and I think our successful outcomes. 100% agree with that. I'm so thankful. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Edward, do we have uh, your connection figured out? And uh, can I come back to you with an answer? Uh, yes, sir. My kidney disease, the internet came and disrupted my life. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, that. That, that, how, how, see how life works. But, um, but yeah, but as I was saying, um, to, to come up, to do what I'm doing, it's 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 beyond my comprehension. So I know it's been above. Uh, one thing, my journey through uh, my kidney disease and other other struggles in my life, I learned that fulfillment trumps success. Like like when I was young, I, I was uh, when I was young, everything was just I got to be successful. Success and, and my, my definition was success was like once once I got sick, I lost everything, right? I lost everything and who was I? Like, who was I? I, I was confused. I, I, once they stripped the, the college student away, the athlete away, like who was I? But like I said, I found my purpose and and my purpose was, I seen, I seen it was it was more to life. It's, 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 I say we're blessed to be a blessing. And if you can make a difference in the lives of someone else, why not? And, and like I said, it's, I know it's. I'm still. I'm still in shock every day, Chris. Um, I'll be honest. It's. I'm just. I'm just doing what the man above called me to do, and and as a result, he he has blessed me in so many uh, areas of my life, from my wife, from having a, a a beautiful wife to a dog to us working on our first children to us being able to go around, like I said, impact impact the lives of just people all across the country, both pre and post, and also like I said, to be able to provide those opportunities to uh to uh to other uh upcoming patients or to other patients and, and like i said it's i'm living a dream every day chris so yeah I just, I just give all the glory to god like i said it's i'm not smart enough to think think of another why not 
or anything else. So why not make a difference? I love what you're doing, Edward. And you, know, you touched on something that I think is so important, the ripple effect. We got to meet your beautiful wife here in Aspen. She accompanied you. And uh -huh. uh, now you've got a dog and you've got a, a uh, you're working yeah. on having kids. And, you know, I think I just celebrated my daughter's uh, 10th birthday yesterday together and had both sets of grandparents here. And the ripple effect of you and I getting our transplants and still being here today uh, and the positive impact that, that we can have on others. And, and as you said, help the 110 plus thousand people that are going through the same thing we did uh, years ago is incredible. So I commend you on that. Thank you. Brian, you, uh, after going through the transplant process, um, you know, something you said earlier really resonated with me. I remember waking up from my transplant and thinking, oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like. I felt whole for the first time. And I knew right then and there, just like you said, I was going to make it back. And uh, my transplant surgeon, Dr. Kam, he, uh, he said, listen, slow down a little bit. We got to keep you on a tight leash. For about <laughs> months. I made it seven weeks. But, you know, you share that same story where you woke up and you, and you knew your purpose and, and you were motivated to not only bounce back, but, you know, as we say, to give back. And that's what this award is all about, is not just returning to a great quality of life, but being inspired to help others along the way. And as Valen said, and Edward alluded to, is, is lifting them up and, and sharing this second chance, this gift that we've been given. But what I wanna specifically ask you is, you, you made it through the transplant, you woke up and you didn't just say, hey, I'm alive and, and I'm going to selfishly live my life for myself now. I, I wanna bounce back, I want to continue my passion of helping others as a fireman, as a first responder, a paramedic, and uh, love to know why, why, and maybe you can touch on a few of the challenges that uh, that, that involved. Yeah, you know what, Chris, um, go, going back to work, it, it was a challenge since it had never been done before. I heard more negative, like, you know, let's, let's put that on the back burner, but um, and maybe you told this to your doctor and, and the other panelists did, but I, I've told my doctor a few times, you've never had me as a patient when they're like, hey, you know, we need to slow down and, and you know, you got this transplant and immunosuppressives and all this stuff. And I used to tell them, look, you've never had me as a patient. You don't know. And uh, we came out of the gate hard. And I, I'm doing sit-ups. I, I still laugh. I have a, a, a little flaw in my belly where my scar is. I popped a couple stitches by doing sit-ups a little too soon when the, the sutures were still in there because I needed to get back to work. And Chris, going back to work and being a medic especially. Now, I had aspirations when I was younger of climbing the chain and getting out of the field work and, and, and being more of a chief or something like that. But after my transplant, it was I am going to be a paramedic and a fireman. And I'm going to touch and hold people. And I'm going to give back the same quality of life that somebody in the healthcare industry. I just love my doctors, my nurses, all the facilities we've been in and out of day in and day out. I'm going to be that person. And I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it with passion. Not because it's my job, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to touch you. And I'm going to be concerned about every word that comes out of your mouth. And for the 12, 15, 20 minutes, I have you as a medic. I am going to give you the best care and love and treatment and passion that I have. And I'm going to do that every single day for the next 16 years that I work after, after transplant in the field. I'm going to be a mentor to the young people. I'm going to be aggressive on fires. I'm going to show them not just for me, but for the next person that says, what is life after transplant? Well, look at that guy. He's fighting fire. He's in the California wildfire season every single year, doing it, doing it, doing it. You got Olympic snowboarder post-transplant that people like us look and say, I'm not a sedentary person. I'm an active person. You're only limited by what, what you want to be limited by. And, and most of us, we have this drive inside that we're returning to, if not better, than where we started. So there was no doubt I was going back to work and there were some hurdles in front of me and there was some um, fibbing about some of the paperwork to my doctor and maybe how good I felt. Um, but doggone it, I was going back to work and I was going to share this gift. And uh, I made it 16 years post-transplant to retirement and 
look at us now. We're retired and loving life. So, yeah, I was driven. Living the life in North Carolina now. I love it. We, we absolutely love it. Yes, sir. I'm a uh, big fan of kiteboarding in the Outer Banks. I'm coming to see you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like hiking up Aspen Mountain, no big deal. We'll go kiteboarding. If you're there, I'm there. Count on it. Right on. Hey, Tracy, you're clearly an avid athlete uh, and an athletic person. Have you always been athletic? And uh, what role did your transplant play in your athleticism and your athletic goals? And, and love to know how your fitness and, and as I said, athleticism uh, really uh, helped with uh, bouncing back from your transplant. Sure. So before my transplant, I was active, Chris, but I would, would never have considered myself an athlete. Um, we skied and, you know, worked out to keep healthy. So interestingly enough, my athletic endeavors came after my transplant, partially um, quite a bit because of Kathy introducing me to the transplant games. I was doing an MS-150 and some bike ridings and then Kathy came, Kathy and John stopped by the house, my donors, my donor's parents, my donor family, and said, hey, there's these transplant games and they're in Disney World and do you want to go? And I'm like, let's go. And so I signed up for cycling that year and, and uh, went out and, and, you know, you never think, I, I'm like, I'm not really competitive. I'm just going to go do this. And you think you're not competitive until you get out there. And then you see that one person and I'm like, I think I can take that double lung recipient over there. I, I've got it. So you get that little competitive edge. And so that grew into um, running and cycling and swimming, which I had done as a child. Um, being the seventh of eight children, you're either strong or you're fast. So I learned how to run and swim and jump at a young age. But, you know, again, it all became more competitive and athletic after my transplant. And it also, just as, as some of your other panelists have said, it opened a real door for me to show that there's life after transplant, that there's health after transplant, to just highlight the success of it, to encourage people on both sides to give so that other people can experience that life and um, to take advantage and be fully engaged once you do receive the gift of life and to go after it. And so uh, I picked up triathlon a couple of years after the transplant games and uh, competed in those and, and was fortunate enough to compete in the Arizona Ironman in 2013, which again was just a real great opportunity for me to raise awareness. And my donor family, John and Kathy, came out there to Arizona and met us there. That happens to be where Terry had passed away. So it was a very meaningful, um, emotional time for us there to be there together. Um, and I won't say that I was competitive at the Ironman, but I finished and I beat my goal. So I was pretty excited about that. But truly it's just been an avenue to really highlight the success of organ and, and tissue donation. And since then recently I've been, um, I've been encouraged by being on the, uh, involved with a lung support transplant group. And so though I'm not a lung recipient, I've been invited to sit in with the, with the group. And so it's, it's really encouraging and, and helpful to me to be able to encourage them when people are, are sick and fighting and to say, you know, there's, there's life after this and you're going to get better and you're going to get healthy and stay there and stay fighting. And, and, uh, and when you are better and healthy, give back and, keep that up, you know, keep up that good work. So it's just been truly an awesome blessing. And I'm looking forward to coming and, you know, I don't, I don't ski very much anymore, but I'm going to put the uh, spikes on my shoes and I'm going to hike up that mountain and I'm going to do some cross country skiing while I'm out there. So I'm excited. It's okay. If you don't ski, Tracy, I'll put you on a snowboard. Very well. I snowboarded too for quite some time. It's just been many years since I've done either. I spent a lot of time down on a snowboard, <laughs> no, it's but it's a lot of fun. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll help you remember. Okay. I'll look forward to that. Likewise. Thank you. Edward, I'd love to know how you found out about uh, Chris Klug Foundation's Bounce Back Give Back Award. Uh, the wonderful people 
up in Columbus, Ohio, nominated me. Um, I, honestly, I had no idea. Like I said, I'm not really into me personally, the war. I just try to just do the work and, and you never know who's watching. And she, uh, she nominated me. I'm thinking Aspen, Colorado. Like I said, I'm not, I've, I've become a, a more outdoors, outdoorsy person uh, as I've gotten older, but I wasn't exposed to it as a child. So, you know, so, but coming out there changed my life, Chris. Um, uh, a special shout out to um, Miss Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn, I, for, I forgot to say her last name, but she nominated me. Like I said, she seen something great in a young man. And uh, I, I wasn't even living on, me and my family moved to George, Atlanta and they still seen the great work we were still doing back home and, and, and other places. And she still nominated me and it changed my life because coming out there, it showed me it was more to life than, than what I was exposed to. So I haven't tried cross country skiing, which almost broke my ankles, but I, I, I can say I did it. And, you know, and I look forward to coming back out there as well and uh, hiking up the mountain as well. And uh, yeah, we, we, me and my buddy, we hiked up the mountain with dress shoes. Like I said, we weren't exposed to it growing up. So, but we made it. So, like I said, so yeah, it, it was a great time. Like I said, that's, that's a memory that still, still uh, warms my heart today. And, and like I said, it opened my mind up uh, to so much more in life so so thank you so much for the opportunity thank you so much for the award and god bless you and your family thank you edward you're always welcome in aspen we'd love to uh welcome you and your wife and uh your future child back to aspen brian hinesley i'd love to uh hear what were some of your favorite memories or uh most memorable uh experiences when you were in aspen when you won the bounce back give back award you, you know what, the, the, the two things, the dinner, right, the energy and everybody in the dinner, but I've been around for a while and I've competed in things. There is nothing like the starting line of the Summit for Life. There is nothing in the world. I told my wife, I'm not doing it. I don't feel good. My back, went, my back hurts, blah, blah, blah. And when I felt the energy, I looked at her and it says, I'm gone. I'm going up. And, uh, I couldn't help it. You bring such an energy. The town of Aspen is so fired up. I mean, I don't care if I was barefoot. I'm going up. And, uh, you know, I think I came in second to last and I had a ball the whole way. And I'm, you know, just <laughs> doing that whole thing and hearing people singing and laughing and loving life and celebrating the Summit for Life and what it stands for, the organ donation side of it. Chris, it, it's the most remarkable thing. And, uh, if I ever come back, I swear I'm not doing it, but I know I'm going to the top. I know I will. The whole way there, I'm not bringing anything to go to the top. But when I get there, that energy is going to push me to the top. So that was it, man. That that Summit for Life start line is absolutely incredible. I love it. Well, I sure have fun uh, helping uh, MC the start. And, and yeah. as you said, it's a uh, highlight every year. So I look forward to being able to do it in person again this year. You bet. Val, and you had uh, a bit of a health hiccup when uh, you came out to receive the uh, Bounce Back Give Back Award. It was more than a hiccup. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Your, uh, your speech that you shared with us on, uh, at the Wine and Dine for Life dinner was very powerful. You were going through a lot at that time. Can you tell us a little bit about the hiccup? For sure, Chris. The event was such a pivotal time in my liver transplant journey and being awarded and coming to the event was just such a huge help for us. So I, about a year or so before your event, was dealing with sepsis episodes. I had about a handful of sepsis episodes prior to coming to your event, and some people have sepsis one time and pass away. So I was severely ill, and shortly before we came to Aspen, we learned that I was going to need a liver transplant and we got to the diagnosis that I was continuing to get sepsis infections and it was because of my liver and we were quite devastated. Well, a couple of days before we were supposed to get on our flight, I woke up with a fever and rigors and was taken immediately to the hospital and had sepsis again. And I was devastated because I was so looking forward to coming to your event. And it's so important for us to have things to look forward to. And especially when we're going through health issues. Well, I was really, really upset in the hospital. And I learned that family was gonna fly into Aspen from Pennsylvania to surprise me and be there to support me. And I just thought, no, why is this happening? But 
from everyone here today, you can tell that we have this drive and zest for life and passion. And because of that grit, I think we are still alive today. And Noah knew how devastated I was. And I honestly was just crying and crying in the hospital. And he was looking at his phone and all of a sudden he said, there's an infusion center in Aspen. And I was like, what? He's like, there's an infusion center in Aspen. And all of a sudden we looked at each other with hope and we were like, we're gonna do it. Now you're talking about just a couple days ago, I was diagnosed with sepsis and I was getting daily IV antibiotic infusions, but we knew if there was an infusion center in Aspen, we could make this work. So I contacted all of the members of my healthcare team and I was like, I really want to go. So long story short, got everything coordinated. We had to reschedule my flight, but we arrived to Aspen in time for the event. I even had to get set up with a doctor in Aspen in order to write my script. Every morning, Noah and I went to the um, infusion center, which Lauren <laughs> took us. So thank you, Lauren. And I got the medicine that I needed. And I was on top of that mountain and received the award. But it was really powerful for us because I remember that dinner before Summit for Life, I was able to just be myself and authentically share the position that I was in and what we were going through and how sick I was and that I was in need for of a liver transplant and the way Aspen and everyone at your event and you embraced us was overwhelming. It gave us such hope. And I, I hear from the community of the hope that my story gives them and I'm always humbled by it and it means so much, but I got a firsthand experience of what hope feels like and how empowering it is because you gave me hope because I looked at you doing so well post liver transplant and then got so embraced by everyone there. And it makes me emotional. It was such a turning point for us, sorry. So I'll never be able to thank you enough because we thought we're gonna be okay. I'm gonna get a liver transplant. And I felt like I was truly embodying bounce back, give back. <laughs> I was like, I am bouncing back yeah. from this sepsis episode and I am gonna be on top of Aspen Mountain no matter what. And I think that that's, that's the beauty of all of us. We face death. We've received the most selfless gift possible of organ donation. We know what really matters and we're gonna do whatever we can to live the best life possible. But like you said, not only just live our life, but do whatever we can to help others and to spread this message of the importance for people to see the life-saving impact they can have on somebody by donating life. And then also for others to see the beautiful life that can be led post-transplant. So receiving this award is so impactful for us. And as you can see, very impactful still to this day. So I can't thank you enough for the honor and just you and Chris Kluge Foundation as a whole means so much to us. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for sharing that, Valen. Beautifully said. It uh, Our community really rallies together for Summit for Life and um, it takes uh, our whole community to pull it off. And uh, it's a, we're a small organization, but uh, we're, we're a national organization, but a lot of our support, a lot of our uh, financial backing uh, derives from this community. So. Summit for Life is a culmination of all of that. And hmm. it sure is neat to share that with uh, you and, and with all of our panelists. And excited to uh, welcome Tracy to be a part of it uh, this winter. Thank you, Chris. Cece, I think we've got uh, a few questions in the chat. Can I uh, bring you on to help us uh, answer some of those? Yeah, yeah, so we do. We have a couple questions. Um, the first one is about the Bounce Back Give Back Award specifically. Actually, no, I'll, I'll start off with um, Drew's question. Uh, he had a, a question specifically for Tracy. Um, was it difficult for you, Tracy, to return to um, athletics and, you know, uh, sort of your daily routine after your transplant? Sure. So it's, it, it, it's not, um, it starts with walking, right? And so when I was in the hospital and I asked uh, my doctor, I said, what, what's the physical therapy now? What do, I, what do I do now? And he said, walk. And when you can walk around the block, walk up the stairs and do it again. And so um, that was a really key. And that's one of the things that I often tell people who are either waiting for a transplant or you know newly transplanted is just walk. If it means you're walking to the mailbox and back, 
then do that and then make it to the end of the street. So actually within about six months of my transplant, um, I was already back to the gym and uh, I was able to ski the following year. So I was back active and all of those things. So um, really there's nothing to hold you back from living a full, complete, 100% just like you were better than you were before transplant because you were so sick prior to that. So um, yeah, within a couple of years, I was back to doing everything that I did and um, to, and, and more um, really just the opportunity to, to take it on and, and, and show how successful that organ transplantation can be and how you can live you know, a, a, a normal, healthy life after. It's funny, I, I meet people afterwards. I met somebody at one point, I was a couple of years out, and they said, gosh, you don't look like a transplant recipient. And I, I looked at them and I said, well, I, I'm not sure what that's supposed to look like. So, you know, unless I guess I walk around with my belly showing and you can see my scar, you, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, uh, we're healthy and we're active. And I think that's really important in our community, uh, both, both to encourage people to become organ donors as well, because um, sometimes that's one of the myths. They think that people are sick and not, not going to get healthy or, or there's, um, there are a lot of myths around organ, organ and tissue donation that we try and dispel as well, but yeah, just um, you'll be healthier than you were prior and just keep up the good work and start it with walking. And before you know it, you're running, you're running up the mountain at Aspen. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That's actually, that's a perfect segue. Um, yeah, we, uh, so Alan asked, uh, what's the summit for life? And I know Tracy, you personally haven't uh, experienced it uh, yet. Um, Chris, did you want to take this and did we want to bring on some of our other uh, bounce back uh, award winners who, uh, you know, have have been there and have experienced it? I'll, I'll let Chris start and we can go from there. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Cece. Well, let me just uh, give you a little background on what Summit for Life is, and then maybe I'll have uh, Brian share uh, a little bit more about his experience. But it's a very unique event. It's a uh, nighttime uphill uh, race, which starts at, in downtown Aspen at the base of Aspen Mountain and climbs 3267 vertical feet over two and a half miles from Gondola Plaza to the top of Aspen Mountain to the Sun Deck. And uh, they've got a great uh, restaurant facility called the Sun Deck on the top. It hosts uh, about 500 people. So when you cross the finish line at the top after two and a half miles and climbing 3000 plus vertical feet, we have a big bonfire that greets you at the finish and a, uh, an announcer, usually my dad and uh, my friend Vince and some others, and uh, everybody cheering you on across the finish line. And then you get your uh, dry bag of clothes and head inside to the sun deck for uh, a concert and dinner and an awards. And yes, yeah, Summit for Life is a, a critical fundraiser for Chris Klug Foundation. But more importantly, it's a celebration of life, of, of second chances and uh, encouraging our whole community. And now with our virtual Summit for Life event, really um, our, our transplant friends and, and recipients and donors all over the country uh, to participate in this event and really becomes a great uh, celebration of second chances and, and a donor awareness event. So that's what it's all about. Brian, you wanna share uh, a, few, a few more stories about your uh, uphill experience? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a ball, I think. <laughs> you, you know, you, you think you're in shape and you, you know, you're exercising, you do all that stuff. You say, I got this. And then the nighttime cold comes and it's a little bit chilly. And but everybody's fired up and you keep thinking man, I don't know if I can do this. And uh, but as the energy is growing and you have your headlights on and it's 14 degrees, whatever, you forget all that. It's kind of like our transplant. We forget all that. We remember what we're celebrating here today. And Tracy alluded to it. You put a foot in front of the other. And it's pretty easy about the first hundred feet. And then it goes up. And it goes up in a hurry. <laughs> it goes straight up. And, so, every, you know, there's aid stations. 
and, and you stop and everybody checks on you, make sure you're okay. And then on to the next aid station. And about halfway through, when you want to quit, you say, I've never quit anything in my life. I'm finishing. And people are encouraging along the way. And it's one foot in front of the other and you get to the top. And when you're in shape like Chris, you get to enjoy dinner and all the festivities. When you're like me, you're out back puking and all that stuff. But uh, you're you're enjoying it. And I had a ball. If I'm there again, I'm doing it again, no matter what. But it, it is the energy of something like I've never seen unparalleled. And everybody should at least experience it once. And you don't have to hike. You can also do the uh, ride for life up the gondola. And that's... Uh, that gives you a pretty interesting uh, perspective or vantage point from the Silver Queen gondola looking down into Spar Gulch and Little Nell. And you see about 400 racers and their headlamps and just this, this line of lights heading up Aspen Mountain that night. Uh, I, I forgot to share that this whole event actually happens at night. So it makes it even more unique, but uh, it's a pretty <laughs> special night. And thanks for being a part of it, Brian, and uh, looking forward to a great event this year. Yeah, thank you, Brian. That's that's awesome. Um, I just have two more uh, quick questions, um, both from anonymous attendees, but just want to address them real quick. They're about our Bounce Back Give Back Award proper. So um, one uh, anonymous attendee asked, uh, they, they would like to nominate a family friend for the award. Um, I can, I think I can just answer this uh, personally. Um, you can nominate them through our website, um, chrisklugfoundation.org, and I will be um, including everybody's or our link to our website, as well as um, to different websites that have been featured here today, such as Balan's website, balankeeper.com, the Why Not Foundation's website, and Sierra Donor, Sierra Nevada Donor, oh, oh my gosh, Sierra Nevada Donor Awareness uh, Foundation's website as well. So um, look into the chat. I'll actually post it right now. Um, so you'll see that in the chat. And um, then the second question we have, um, if there is an age requirement for the Bounce Back Give Back Award, uh, yes, you do have to be 18 years or older at the time of the awards to qualify. Um, but other than that, uh, there's it's really, um, besides being an organ transplant, that's those are pretty much the only two requirements. Um, and you know, if you have a family friend, uh, friend, family member that you would like to nominate, we are uh, totally uh, encourage you to do that. We're super excited for this year and hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll be in person this year and we get to finally meet Tracy Copeland uh, in person as opposed to um, you know, over, over the uh, Zoom chat <laughs> as we did last year. So uh, Chris, if you have anything else to say, um, or if anybody, you know, any panelists have anything else to say, we, we encourage you to uh, chime in. <laughs> Thanks a lot, CC. Yeah, I'd like to give everybody uh, just one minute uh, each to share any closing remarks. Uh, again, I just want to say thanks to uh, Brian, to Valen, to uh, Edward, and to Tracy for being a part of uh, this conversation this afternoon. And, and thanks for all of you guys do to help inspire others that are going through the same thing that uh, all of us did. And uh, you guys all are, are real heroes to me. You're an inspiration to me. And uh, I love what you're doing to help others. And that's what this is all about, is not just bouncing back, but giving back also. And so, uh, Brian, why don't I pass it to you first? And uh, if you just want to share any closing remarks, anything that uh, I didn't touch on or may have left out that uh, as we conclude our conversation here. You know, you know, Chris, you do such a fantastic job of hitting all the bases, but anybody out there that's looking to join an organization, be a, a, an ambassador or, or get involved, uh, you know, and we're involved a lot, but I think the Klug Foundation, you, you'll feel at home, you'll get the answers, you'll get able to be able to participate all around the country when you do your little donor dues and all that stuff. This is a great organization and it, it gets the message out from their toolkit to teachers, everything that you want to know, the ABCs about organ donation. Um, like you say, you're small and you fight way above your weight class and you offer a powerful punch. That's right, brother. And uh, so anybody out there that's watching and listening, if you want to get involved, check out the Clue Foundation. You get the personal touch. Uh, they're small, but they're mighty. And I, I would uh, encourage you to check out their website for any information or questions you might have. Yeah. Thanks, brother. That means a lot. I appreciate yeah. it. You bet. Uh, Tracy, do you want to share any final comments? Well, thanks, Chris. Oh, I'm starting to go. I think I'm there. There we go. <laughs> um, 
You know what? I'm just so grateful. I just want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this in this webinar today, this event uh, for your organization. It's just um, it's been wonderful to watch what you've been able to do nationally. And, um, you know, I know that it's the Summit for Life being your primary fundraiser. It is difficult. And last year was a difficult year. So we're just looking forward to a really great year this next year. Um, I wish everybody, you know, continued health and success. And, um, you know, I, I just want to thank you for having me. Thank you for what you're doing out in the community to raise awareness, to show the success, to, to highlight people who have bounced back and are giving back. And, and I want to thank all the panels, what you're doing in your communities and um, all around. It's just, it's uh, so inspirational and I'm inspired by you all. And uh, I'm just really grateful. And lastly, I just want to highlight, I want to honor our donors and our donor families. I want to thank them for giving the gift of life. You know, most, most of them in the midst of their own unimaginable grief thought of someone else and um, realized that this time the miracle wasn't theirs to receive, but theirs to give. And so thank you for giving the miracle and the gift of life. Tracy, you're absolutely right. Uh, organ donors are the real gold medalists in this whole process. Keep up the good work. I can't wait to see you in early December uh, back in Aspen. Edward, any uh, final comments you want to share with, uh, with our panel and with our attendees? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you, Chris, and your, the, thank you, CC, and thank the entire uh, Chris Klug Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor and one I don't take for granted. I also would like to uh, thank my donor family, uh, my donor family, Leanne, uh, who saved my life back in 2008. Um, uh, rest in peace, she's, she's a deceased donor, but um, always, I tell all the, all the kids and, and people I speak with that she saved my life so, so I can impact the lives of thousands of others and help others do the same and usher, help not only me, not only for me to impact lives, but one of my goal is to help uh, help usher others into their greatness. That's why I have a company called Why Not Me Enterprises, where you know it's okay for me to do it, but why not if you can reach back and help others, show them the way, invest in invest resources in them, and to help them find their purpose. Of course, why not? So I definitely want to thank Leanne and her family um, for the opportunity. Uh, I, I participated in a, in a transplant game many times, and I definitely. I always send one of my gold medals uh, to, to her family for their thanks, uh, to thank them for his opportunity. When I, wrote, when I wrote them briefly, when I wrote them, I couldn't think of the words to thank them for the gift that their daughter gave me. So I said, words are meaningful, but actions are powerful. I was going to allow my actions to show them my gratitude and to show them my appreciation for the gift that their daughter gave me. So, and lastly, I would like to tell anyone out there who's battling any type of uh, 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 difficulty or, or adversity, um, always know that a test equals a testimony. And I created a quote that say, adversity plus faith plus perseverance equals a purpose and a life testimony. And I'm living proof that uh, you know, it, it'll help lead you to your purpose. So again, God bless you all and uh, blessings and stay safe. You too, Edward, you're a great ambassador of uh, the transplant community and of all recipients. Thanks for all you're doing. Keep it up and I hope to see you again soon. Valen, you get uh, the final words before I pass the uh, control back to you. So uh, love to hear uh, a few more comments from you as we wrap up. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor to be able to help wrap up this amazing webinar. And there's something so special about you and the Chris Klug Foundation. And I think it's the authenticity of you and Lauren and CC. And it has been just, I love collaborating with you. I love you guys, period. And I feel grateful to be able to call you my friends and to have the platform of your organization to share my story. Because I, I think for, for myself personally, it's really therapeutic to be able to do advocacy efforts like this. It gives purpose to what I've endured. It just is just 
fuels my passion to continue to move forward the best I can on this journey. And I just adore all of you. And I'm grateful for the work that you do. And I agree with everything Brian said. I mean, it's just, I'm always in all at all you're able to accomplish. And you have such a small and mighty team. It's just amazing. <laughs> and I was one of the gondola riders. So I can say how amazing even the ride up the mountain was <laughs> for Summit for Life. It was so amazing to have it be nighttime and see all the little lights of everyone climbing up the hill. And I remember we were like screaming out the gondola and cheering everyone on. I mean, there's such energy at this event, like no other event. And I just feel really lucky to have been able to be a part of it. I highly recommend for anyone to nominate someone that's received a transplant and is doing great work in their communities. And it's really an experience of a lifetime and one that I will treasure. And of course, as I shared earlier, the hope that you gave me was so powerful during a pivotal time when I really needed it, when I just found out that I needed a liver transplant myself. So thank you for everything, Chris. And um, I just, I can't wait to come back to Aspen. No one, I wanna come back. <laughs> I'll ride the gondola again. Noah might climb up the mountain. <laughs> As I said to uh, Edward and to Brian and Tracy, of course, Tracy's coming uh, for the first time for uh, the Summit for Life this winter, but you guys are always welcome. And you are, uh, you and Noah and all of our panelists are some of my favorite people on earth. And uh, I, I really am inspired by all of you. And thanks for all you do. Thank you, Chris. Cece. Thank you for organizing this uh, conversation. And as uh, both Brian and uh, Edward and um, Valen just said, you know, we, we are a small but mighty organization and that's thanks to you and, and to Lauren who had a, uh, a beautiful little boy, Benjamin recently and uh, is out of commission right now, but uh, Cece is stepping up and doing a beautiful job. So thanks for another great conversation today. Oh, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, you know, the goal of the webinar was not only to inspire those in attendance with stories of perseverance and success after transplant, it's also to highlight the Chris Kluge Foundation's annual Bounce Back Give Back Awards and provide a more personal perspective to what the awards really mean. So um, if you have any questions that weren't addressed or answered in today's webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us at info at uh, We've included, or I will include this email in the chat. <laughs> if you're interested in learning more about the Chris Kluge Foundation, the Why Not Foundation, uh, Sierra Nevada Donor Awareness, or uh, Valen's website, we've included links to these websites in the chat as well. Um, also, because April is Donate Life Month and the beginning of this year's Bounce Back Award process, we invite you to share your stories of recovery and bouncing back after transplant to have it featured as a part of this special and inspiring month. So with that, I will, um, you know, sign off. We hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy and uh, happy Donate Life Month, everyone. <laughs>